Kia ora tātou katoa. Ka mihi kia koutou katoa ko puta mai tēnei pō ahua makariri nei. Engari, ko koutou ko puta mai ki te whakarongo ki kia mātou ka nui te mihi kia koutou katoa. Tai atu ki te komihana. Ka mihi rā, i whakatū whira nei te kuaha o te whare, ke ake mai tātou ki konei. Ki konei tātou kōraro ai, wānanga ai, whakawhitiwhiti whakaaro ai, ka nui te mihi. Kei ware ware iau ko te āhua tango te hunga ko ngaro atu te tirohanga ka nui. E hia kēnei nā mea koa ko ngaro atu i tēnei tau hau pākeha nei, ka tangi ake kia rātou katoa. Ko reo e whakahua i ngoa kei mahua ake tētahi. Engari ka mihi kia tātou katoa me te kia atu ko rātou kia rātou, a nei tātou i tēnei pō tēnā kūtou, tēnā kūtou. Kia ora tātou. Kia ora tātou. Thank you very much. Pēreri, tēnā koe. Thank you very much for the welcome and good to be here. I just better check because I've got a list of people to acknowledge and I can't see any of them in the room. Uh, but just in case, if there's any of the commissioners here uh, associated with disabilities or, or, uh, or EEO or race relations, anything else like that, kia ora. Uh, just to cover you off and thank you, Peter uh, uh, for the opportunity. I want to thank the uh, commission for the opportunity to have this wānanga um, because it's good to pull together a, a group of speakers and of course for you all to come out tonight. So thanks very much for being here. So for those of you who don't know me, yeah, my name is Te Rua, uh, and I come from, from Te Arawa. Sure. Any Te Arawa in the room? Sure. <laughs> uh, and of course Ngāti Raukawa on that side, and also from Ngāpui uh, as well. So um, um, I have five children, uh, and just to set, sort of set the scene about what sort of makes me tick, I suppose, is that I'm a teacher. I was a teacher of physical education. <laughs> just, just saying, um, and Māori language as well, uh, back in the day, and have uh, been at uh, pretty much uh, since I left school, uh, since Stephen's school, have been involved in education pretty much most of my career until I came across uh, the foreshore and seabed issue that basically catapulted me into Parliament. Uh, so if I had my day, I'd go back to teaching at the drop of a hat. In fact, that might come in another three years' time, uh, or it might come in another six months' time, I don't know. Uh, but be that as it may, I really have a passion for, for teaching. I love the interaction with students. So um, my wife and I have been married about 30-something years. Uh, thank goodness she's not here because I'd be getting a whack around the, um, around the ears uh, for not knowing exactly how many years, but I'll just say about 30-something. Uh, and she's from Taranaki, and she went to a boarding school as well. Uh, and so we got married and uh, have five children and it was never a discussion about whether Māori language would be the language of the home. It wasn't even discussed, it was, that's it. So all of our children are first language, uh, Māori language speakers. Uh, they all grew up through a Māori language, the language of our home is Māori. And this year, uh, because of the fact that I, uh, uh, I come in and out of Parliament and bring in Māori language uh, situations that I speak Māori out of Māori, back into Māori, back out of Māori, it's sort of like uh, my head was buzzing at times. So when I went home, uh, I'd end up, even though my wife is also a speaker of Māori, we're both second language speakers, uh, and I'd go home, we'd all automatically stay in English, and yet our children come home, flick back into Māori again. And so this year we made a resolution that at home we would actually basically stay in, in Māori for the whole time which is good because it's kept us focused about what we want for our, our tamariki and our mokopuna. And I always say that there's nothing better that keeps you centred about this belief and this absolute um, commitment to our reo than when you have your mokopuna, that's your grandchild, speaking Māori to you. That's, that for me is just, that's it. To have your mokopuna speak Māori back to you, albeit it's sort of mixed up with gaga, goo goo and ah, uh, screams, it uh, doesn't matter because when they're able to talk to you and, they, and just say the word koro, then you know that we've got another generation of language speakers that are coming through. So that's my background and so you'll understand that I'm pretty passionate about te reo and have high expectations of, of what I expect. So um, against that background, I suppose now I'm in Parliament and saying and been in Parliament for 10 years or so, or 12 years, then okay, well what does this all mean and how does it all come together? Well, I'm also been a, I've been a teacher of uh, treaty training and so I sort of understand that uh, uh, in our history, in our collective history over time, there have been efforts on the part of this government, or that government, uh, that government that sort of used to uh, resides in, in Parliament and is uh, symbolic of our history, has been responsible for all sorts of methodologies to get rid of and wipe, the, uh, wipe Māori language off the face of the earth uh, by deliberate policies that are writ well recorded in Parliament. Uh, uh, over a long period of time and over our history uh, and data collected over a long period of time, we know that consistently 
Um, there have been stages that have been dis uh, phases about Māori language that raise from that, 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 that talk about vitality, decline, and resurgence. So once upon a time, our, just everybody spoke Māori. Then the loss of our language, the decline, and now we're in a state of resurgence. Although it's not to the state that I hope that I'd always hoped that we would be at. So the facts are clear that our language was actively discouraged by the Crown. Assimilation policies were, were brought in and, and in some cases three generations of language speakers gone. The whole inability to speak Māori for three generations is amongst us right now. For some the loss is irreversible and in fact some of our own people believe that actually what's the point of having Māori language in this country? You, you can't get by with Māori language in this country. You've got to go to the shop. You've got to go and buy bread and stuff like that. Now come on. That's that sometimes our own people believe that. So we've got a lot of uh, decolonizing, de-activating uh, in the brain to do about the value of our language, not only to my own people, but to this nation, because even the nation has bought into that sort of notion that the language of ec the economy is Chinese, it's Mandarin, it's Japanese, or whatever else it might be. And there's some experts over here that can tell you about that, uh, Rawinia uh, and, um, and Nahiwe. In approximately 65% of Māori homes where Māori children reside, there is no Māori language, no language speaker. So it tells us we're in dire straits and we have to do something about it. So the Waitangi Tribunal found that, naturally, as I said before, that the Crown policies and practice in respect of Māori language was not simply confined to the 1850s through to the 1970s, but actually continues even today that there are still policies and I suppose a lack of acceptance about the value of Māori language as a language of this land that you can't find anywhere else that does have value to all of us. Now how do we know? Well, because most of you, most of us sing it uh, when we sing that national anthem, although that came with a bit of a battle as well. Uh, when back in 1999, uh, Henewehi Moi stood up in front of the whole nation and at a test stood and uh, sang the, the national anthem in Māori, in Māori only, and got wasted. Uh, by the me media and everybody else for having the audacity to sing the national anthem in Māori. Well, what is it today? It's everybody hand on chest, e -i -o -a, and so on and so forth, and the English version follows. So we've, we're developing over time an acceptance of our language, but there's still a hell of a lot to do. So what I do know about treaties and about things like UNDRIP uh, declarations is that generally they go with the notion of of rights and obligations. If I take the Treaty of Waitangi, the treaties are about rights and obligations. You have the rights to come here, uh, but you also have some obligations to the people that you're going to work with. That's how treaties are generally set up. Same with declarations. And so, in terms of Māoridom, generally we fall back to those treaties and those declarations as being important to how we deal with some of the effects of a, a colonisation, assimilation, and around straight out treaty breaches. And you'll be aware pretty much that we go to the Treaty of Waitangi and say, Te Tiriti o Waitangi is where we get our rights to, the, to this, that and the other thing, whether it be land or our culture or otherwise. So most New, Zealander, New, New Zealanders hear about the treaty settlement process. That is about addressing that sort of stuff. And similarly with UNDRIP, that UNDRIP came about uh, way back when it was, and New Zealand didn't buy into UNDRIP until the National Party came along and they decided to have a little bit of a debate actually with the Māori Party, of whom I'm the co-leader. And at the time as a MP, we had uh, Dame Tariana Turia, uh, Dr Peter Sharples, Sir Dr Peter Sharples at the time as co-leaders of our party. And uh, knowing that Labour was not going to support it, that we had also the ear of people like the Mourner Jacksons of this country, the Annette Sykes of this country, the Cathy Irwins of this country, uh, saying that we should be supporting this United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it seemed that we should take that battle up, which we did. And so I was proud to be with Dr Peter Sharples at the UN when New Zealand declared its support for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And it is a time and a day that I will never ever forget. Little did I know, that, however, the impact that that would have on the indigenous communities throughout the world and indeed our own people. I say that because as soon as Peter stood up uh, and made that declaration, indigenous peoples from out, throughout the world standing in the, the, uh, uh, in the pavilion for the UN all stood up and started clapping. They just stood up with loud applause and said, yes, awesome. And we had a fair bit of uh, um, media coverage on that to say that 
Righto, New Zealand's there, along with other countries that have slowly but surely come around to adopting the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And one part of that uh, declaration is Article 13. And that says, it has a couple of points, and it says, quote, Indigenous peoples have the right to revitalise, use, develop and transmit to future generations their histories, languages, oral traditions, philosoph philosophies, writing systems and literatures. So that's great. It sets the tahu, it sets the sort of uh, the backbone of us being able to implement stuff back at home here. It also says states shall take effective measures to ensure that this right is protected, which basically puts it hard and fast on the government to be able to do that. And so uh, it should be no surprise then that, uh, uh, that we were happy with those sorts of clauses, and in particular with respect to our culture and our language, and therefore we're able to push it, although with a little bit of, uh, of manoeuvring with the national government to get it over the line. So we're really proud about that. So at that time, of course, um, uh, Peter, as the, as the mover and shaker of that, and it was a few years after as a minister, um, the thought for us as a party was, well, oh, that's all good. All these words are nice and, and rosy, but actually what happens on the ground? Is it really going to make a difference, that declaration, like the treaty, is it actually going to make a difference to the lives of people and indeed the uh, revitalization come survival of our language into the future. And so I don't know because I was doing other stuff, but I'm pretty sure that Peter decided that that was where we needed to head. And so he pulled, there was a number of reports that had been circulated over time. He was a part of gathering up information amongst our people about where we go with respect to Te Reo Māori. Rawinia was a part of that as well. There were a number of reports which I won't, I won't go over. Uh, the long and short of it, however, was that our people wanted to take control of our, of, of our language. They felt that there was too much government intervention, uh, too much the government saying this, saying that you will do this, you will do that, that actually they wanted to have the resources to be able to do the things that they believed was right for our language. But they also said there's a part to be played by the Crown. Why? Because of the treaty responsibility. And so at that time then, uh, um, uh, I became a minister and I asked Darwinia to and set up, I set her up, um, <laughs> I set her up with a panel uh, to go about the country to start opening the, the debate up. The downside was that when the bill was first pulled together, uh, basically there, there was a problem. The problem was deciding where do the resources go? Shall I stay with the Crown or shall they go over to the Māoris? That was the problem. And thank goodness uh, she's going to tell you about how the model came about that set us up with this Māori language bill. So I won't sort of go into that, that's where she can stay because she was pretty much the architect of that whole, the structure that allowed us to have a new Māori language bill. So I think the one thing that we can say, however, and just coming back from it is that the UNDRIP is a connector of indigenous peoples throughout the world. That provides us an ability to go out and talk with other indigenous brothers and sisters about the same common views that we have about language. So for example, I've been uh, to the Ainu people. Who know about the Ainu people? Yeah, there's about two or three. I didn't know about the Ainu people too until we managed to hook up. They happen to be the indigenous people of Japan. They live in the Northern Islands and they have all but about less than 50 speakers of their own language left uh, alive now. And so when we hooked up with them, they were about, in fact, I went over there because they launched a political party called the Ainu Party. Uh, and uh, they only, ha they, if you understand this, that you have to get a million voters uh, just to even get on the scale, and that's out of the umpteen million that they've got in Japan, so they're never ever going to make it, but there was that determination like we have had in the past to maintain their culture and their language. They're only a small group of people uh, uh, amongst the big group of, of Japan. Why? They got colonised to bits, and they, they carry a bit of hurt about the loss of their language and culture. So UNDRIP connects us to them. And I can say happily that uh, we're sending over people and have brought people over here to learn how to teach them Te Aotaarangi, the Cuisinier Rod method, which allows them to retain their language. So are we ahead of the game in many other places? Yes, we are. Of course we are with Kura Kaupapa Māori, Kō Hangareo. We have a, a Māori Language Commission. We are ahead of the game of the, uh, in terms of uh, our ability to recognise and want our language to be spoken and we have the population that's close enough to be able to do that. You go to Tokyo, hell. You know, you get in one cafeteria, you, you'd be lucky to have all the speakers in one place, much less the whole of the city. So they find it very, very difficult. But have we got it all? And the answer is probably not. Because not long ago, I went across and had a look at the, uh, the efforts made by Wales and Ireland to retain their language as well. And found that actually, even in Ireland, 
they've decided to have a bilingual city called Galway. And I thought to myself, holy cow, Tokoroa, oh no, maybe not, <laughs> uh, Rotorua, oh, uh, might be there, that we could look at a bilingual city where, and they have a, basically a policy that says uh, uh, that everything, all signs in the whole of the town will be bilingual. They will be uh, uh, presented in both English and Irish, but Irish will always be at the top. So everything from road signs to ev even in the cafeterias, everything must be bilingual. So in our case, we're well behind the, the bar in that. But nevertheless, the bar has been set for us to be able to, uh, to do something about it. Then we went to Wales and found out that they are developing Kurakaupapa Māori, schools that cater for those children that want to learn through Māori language. And the funny thing is that they're only small cohort, uh, but everybody's starting to like them because they're achieving successes. Uh, they're getting the academic success that the other schools are not getting with their own people which is basically the same argument that's happening here in Aotearoa where Kura Kaupapa Māori are achieving those same high results with the smaller cohort, which you'd understand. So the great thing about the UNDRIP clauses, um, coming back to the topic, is to say that it's a, it connects us as a people across the world to other indigenous peoples and allows us to share ideas and it reminds us too that we're not alone, that other indigenous peoples have the same struggles that we have with respect to Māori language. So um, over time, I'm hoping that we can build on the successes of this Māori language build that we've, we've managed to put in place. Well, why? Because it has come with some struggle. Uh, and, and as I said, it wasn't easy just taking out and going out to the into communities and saying, right, we've got a new Māori language bill. Actually, actually, these ones got pillared uh, by our own people saying, give more money, do this, do that, you're wrong, it's a government motiv motivated, uh, blah, 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 blah. So uh, the one regret, the huge regret, regret that I've had uh, ever since that bill was that uh, these people like Rawinia and the group of experts that I put in charge of trying to frame up the, the, the Māori language bill uh, basically got taken to task about what they were doing and how they were motivated and what was their, uh, what was their reasoning for moving towards developing this bill. That was the first time. The second time when they had to go back when we'd listened to all the kōrero, it was far better. The third time they went back pretty much it was not a lot of, not a people turned up and it wasn't about almost, it wasn't applause was it? Not quite, wasn't applause, but they understood that we'd finally got to a place where they could live with. So the Ture Fin was a new act um, that has come out of efforts which I think are linked to the UNDRIP. They come off that because what we've done is to be able to place the responsibility of both iwi in their right place as well as the Crown in its right place as well. Together, we're looking to, um, at this point, the law actually says we've got to have two strategies, but I think that in the experience that we gained um, in going overseas, Actually, we should have one strategy, but having both parts to have a part to play. But that's still to be debated about uh, where we go from there. So uh, the great thing about this bill, just to sort of wrap up, because I'm pretty sure my time is just about up, is that there is a part to be played. So they shaped it up on the, on the shape of a whareinui, uh, and they put everybody, I think, in the right place. So across the top of the whareinui, which is you have the sort of roof, is called te ruranga reo which is basically bringing together representatives of the Ao Māori and Crown Ministers. So it's four by four, four by four, equal numbers, whatever it is, um, that come together to debate the whole issue about Māori language, that's Crown Ministers and representatives of iwi. Uh, underneath that, on the left-hand side of the whare, is called the Māihi Rauna, uh, which is basically the, Māori, the Crown side of the debate, and that is to say that those government agencies that are looking after uh, the Crown side, namely Te Taura Whiri, Te Reo Māori, uh, Te Māngai Pāho, Māori Television Service, all sit within the Crown. And so they have a responsibility to come up and assist ministers, along with education, along with cultural and heritage, to be able to provide strategies that feed into the combined strategy. And on the other side of the coin, we have 13 representatives of Māori collective uh, groups for seven iwi uh, districts, plus four stakeholder groups, I think, and um, two appointments from the minister, namely myself. And they come together, and that's called Te Mātawa, if you hear that word, that's that, that's that collective there, who are the Mahi Māori, the Māori side of the equation, and together they have their CEOs meet with uh, the Crown to discuss the higher picture. So we've got responsibilities on the Crown side, responsibilities for every side. And just to finish up, the, the last part of the equation is that um, where, for example, television was won by, uh, where we have boards that are crown appointments, now the Māori uh, element is able to make appointments to that board on recommendation. 
Um, and so it's, it's panned out quite nicely. But the downside is it's only been six months or so that it's been operating and that we're still working through having all that sort of stuff shaped up. But nevertheless, the big thing is that we have at least the starting point. So that's all good. I suppose the message is, is it really going to make a difference to the number of speakers of Māori language in this country? And one thing that I did really take note of when I was overseas was that the approach that's been taken by, uh, by other countries like Ireland and Wales is totally different and uh, opposite to where I've been thinking as a teacher. My thing in the past is got to teach people, got to keep teaching them, keep telling them, how, um, get them learning how to speak Māori language and that will make everything sweet. Well, actually it doesn't. I've come to the conclusion, actually, you've got to warm people to the idea, take the country with you, and that you've got to do a hell of a lot of planning and basically decolonise the mind about the value of language before anybody will ever move. So it's all been, my, my approach in the past has been pretty hard-nosed. Come on, learn the language, learn the language, learn the language. If you're going to go to Kohanga, your kids, that you're not going to learn any language, therefore you as a parent, you must learn language. If you don't, if you don't learn the Māori language, don't send your kid to a Kohanga reo. Pretty hard approach but I've mellowed a bit. On the back of uh, seeing what happens and a real approach taken by other countries to say, and this is the value of, as I say, UNDRIP, that you see what everybody else is doing, is basically to say, unless this country turns on to the value of the indigenous language of this country, we'll always have a struggle. We will always have a struggle. Mm -hmm. And the greatest thing is that I've seen, even just in the short space and time being home, I did a tweet about it. Uh, it was about Dan the Man, the Weather Man, on uh, Television One. I, mean, I don't know where that fellow's from, but, um, uh, but I, I, I did tweet to him and say, Dan, you're the man, uh, because you're actually at least trying to enunciate Māori words, and you can tell he's trying, because in the past I would have said, get off, uh, you're butchering my language, but actually he's trying, and I thought, wow, that's awesome, that he's actually taken it, and he's got a public profile, you know, every night on TV, similarly with television, uh, sorry, with uh, Radio New Zealand reporters, Hell, right now they're all saying, call, call Melanie Sanso Tene, more morning report. Awesome. That's about profiling and giving it that, uh, that, that um, lifting the bar. And I think they, the, the biggest faux pas, I don't know whether it was a faux pas or a good idea, uh, but we had a major, um, a major hui in Auckland this year, or last year, celebrating the top uh, businesses throughout the whole of New Zealand. This is, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in the room with the Prime Minister. And one guy got up and, uh, and he, he, he pronounced certain Māori words. He tried. <laughs> he tried. And, and I thought to myself, you know, I, I, like I said, I would have probably told him to sit down in the past, but actually that he had consciously thought and picked it up that he would try. So in front of all these people I said, bro, well I didn't say bro, I said, that's awesome. You are a role model for everybody else. You're in the top echelon of businesses in New Zealand. If you can actually try, that sets the bar for the whole country and your area. So to all of you who saw this gentleman, give him a big hand. They all go, whoa. In fact, I went a little bit further and I said, I want to hear a collective chur. They all chur. So there's the acknowledgement. So that's where I'm hoping that sort of, this sort of discussion will take us. I see most of you are young. Uh, in here and probably this is where the change is going to happen because the older generation a little bit stuck in their ways, our ways and therefore uh, we don't change too easily in fact almost rock solid in the head about change whereas you younger ones who have come through a schooling system that has been a little bit more liberal and given you a little bit more about the value of the treaty, uh, about treaty issues, about language issues I think are far more receptive and ultimately, I think the biggest test is when we can see people like you who are prepared to take your children to Kohanga Reo because we still have barriers around that. Uh, that's, that's, that would be the ultimate. Or not just Kohanga Reo, actually Puna Reo, those sorts of things because that would be the ultimate test when everybody has been able to accept that. Look, my kids, I've got a doctor, I've got two, ch two, two teachers. We ain't going to be suffering from lack of English, for goodness sake, hell. Our kids learn English as soon as they bling and wake up every morning from television, radio. So ne that's never a fear. Will we have Māori language around? No. And that's the key. We've got to change our mindset as a country. And you just being here tonight, number one. Number two, that you're young. 
looking for partners, I think. No, no, just joking. <laughs> ah, and can make a change in the difference of our country is where we need you to be. Thank you very much for ha having me. I hope that's been helpful. Kia ora koutou.